Good morning. Great to see some new folks up here and some new roles. Caleb, great job on that scripture reading. You're angling for my job, I can tell. But that's what we want. We started down the road with Jesus. Back in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, you might remember where it said that when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. So since then, our Lord has been on the move from Galilee to Jerusalem where the cross awaits him. He has done many things along the way. He has taught. He has healed. He's debated, and he has loved people all along. And now here in Luke chapter 17 and verse 11, Jesus begins the last leg of his journey. And Luke writes, on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. Now Jesus is about to meet a group of men who were, by law, forced to practice extreme social distancing. Not the six feet that, that we've gotten used to the last couple of years, but more like 50 yards or more. And they were also supposed, supposed to cover their mouths and, and noses and actually cry out a warning. Can you imagine? when somebody approached uh, something like unclean, unclean. And, and so they were in what we would call mandated isolation because of their physical condition. Now Jesus has already encountered somebody like this in the, the Gospel of Luke, somebody with this same physical condition back in chapter 5 of the Gospel. He came upon a man who had a particularly terrible case of this malady. In fact, Luke, who was a physician, uh, describes him in these words. He says he was full of leprosy. Bad enough to have leprosy, but then Luke describes him as full of leprosy. And this man, back in chapter 5, was so desperate that he broke the mandate and he came near enough to fall down at Jesus' feet and beg for help. And Jesus proceeded to do something that no rabbi in his right mind in that day would have done. That is, he reached out and touched the man. This man that was full of leprosy. leprosy. He actually touched this guy who had this raging, contagious skin disease. And of course, he healed him instantly when he touched him. And word of this spread like wildfire. Jesus apparently considered this work a basic trait and characteristic of his ministry, his public ministry. Um, so, when, for instance, his cousin John, um, that we, we call John the Baptist, John is in prison and he's uh, struggling with his faith. And he sends a question through his followers to Jesus about whether Jesus was really the one that they were looking for. Was he really the Messiah? And Jesus responded, he sends word back to John about all that was happening that proved that, yes, he was who he claimed to be, uh, that, that he was the Messiah. Luke chapter 7, verse 22, these are the words Jesus told them to tell John. He says, go and tell John, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed. And so it's no surprise what happens here in Luke chapter 17. Let's 
look at it a little more closely. Verse 12. And he entered a village, and as he did, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. It's, it's hard to imagine how awful it was to have leprosy in the ancient world. We don't know exactly what it was, this thing they called leprosy. There's a modern disease that's uh, described as leprosy. It's, I think, usually called Hansen's disease. It's probably not the same thing that was going on in the first century, at least not the only thing that was called leprosy at that time. Hansen's disease is a disease that attacks the nerves of the body, destroys the nerves and sort of kills them and then the one suffering can't feel pain and so they injure themselves and, and that kind of thing. It's awful. Uh, but what the Bible calls leprosy may have been a lot of things that could afflict the skin, a number of skin diseases, rashes, psoriasis, lupus, other things we don't even know about today, perhaps. Some kind of infectious skin disease. There's two chapters in the Old Testament that are devoted to dealing with this. Leviticus chapters 13 and 14. Just dedicated to what to do about somebody afflicted with this is often thought of as incurable unless you could get a miracle. And sadly, at least by Jesus' time, it was assumed that if you had this, it came upon you because you had sinned. So not only were lepers suffering terribly physically, but they were forced into isolation from society, away from their family, away from anybody that they knew, only allowed to be around other people with the same thing, forced to live in the outskirts of towns and villages, and considered sinners, obviously, because how else could you explain their terrible misfortune of having this thing? These ten men cry out to Jesus, shouting these words, but they don't say unclean, unclean, as was custom and as the law instructed them to do. They shout, have mercy on us, because they know the reputation of the Lord. As a healer, and, and news of him obviously preceded his presence in their community. They even call him master. That's something that only disciples call Jesus in the Gospels. But on this occasion, these men call him master. Jesus, master, have mercy on us. I want you to notice how Jesus handles it. Doesn't make a big show. He doesn't call the media. Doesn't seek cameras or news reporters. Doesn't assemble an arena full of witnesses. He doesn't even seem to, to, to touch these men like he did the one in chapter 5, or speak impressive words, or smack them in the forehead, or, or, or any of the things that faith healers today do to make a show. None of that nonsense when the Lord 
confronts this dread disease. Jesus just says, go show yourself to the priests. Go show yourself to the priests. What was that about? Well, that's what the law said to do. If you had leprosy, if, if you thought somehow you were over it, that it had gone away, what you were supposed to do was go to the local priests, the priests in every town, find a priest, show yourself to the priest, take a leprosy test, and move forward. Apparently, that's exactly what the ten do. They believe Jesus. They apparently believe in the possibility of miracles. And so they turn and they head to the priest. And as they do, they're cleansed of their leprosy. As they go, they're cleansed. Jesus indeed shows them mercy. Ten men are cleansed from a dread disease. Ten men believed in miracles and one man healed them. Now, the story could end right here and it, it would still be wonderful and amazing and we'd rejoice in it, wouldn't we? It's a wonderful thing. We would praise God, but that's not all there is here in Luke 17. So let's look at the rest of the story. We're going to find out a few things as we read on. One is that nine of these men believed in miracles, but only one of them believed in Jesus. We're going to find out that, that ten men were healed, but only one was saved that day. We're going to find out that there was a condition that was actually worse than leprosy. All ten of them had something worse wrong with them than a physical disease, something that they could, could only be cured of by real faith. And we're going to be reminded that the man here didn't have to do some great thing, some, some wondrous thing in order to be saved. He just had to have enough faith to turn back to Jesus and say something that hopefully we all were taught to say when we were children. Thank you. Verse 15, then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now, he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. The rest of the story here includes the fact that one of the ten men who were healed was a Samaritan. Isn't it amazing what unites people? You know, in Jesus' day, as I'm sure you're aware, you can rest assured that if you saw a group uh, of ten men hanging out in Israel, there may have been ten Jews in one group and maybe ten Samaritans in another group, but never would you find any mixture of those two groups hanging out. Unless they had leprosy. Then you might find a mixing because they had no choice. And so there were nine Jews and one 
Samaritan united by a dread disease. There was really only one other thing that united groups like this, and that was Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth brought people like that together. He could put the two together, and he did. I was thinking about this. We've come through two years of a worldwide pandemic that hopefully, hopefully is weakening, lessening. And you would think that that would have united humanity in the fight against it. And maybe it did in some ways, but there was, as we all know, an awful lot of division in our country, at least, over it. I'm not called by the Lord to talk about politics, so I'm not going to talk about politics. It has no place here. But isn't it sad that, you know, in our day and age, with all our knowledge and experience and, and all our modernity, an illness that we were all afflicted in some way by divided so many against one another. Leprosy could unite Jews and Samaritans and even get them to live together in a community. We moderns seem worse off. But let me also say this positive side of it. As Christians, followers of Jesus, right here in Lancaster, Ohio, in this church, we stood together and endured it. We prayed together. We encouraged one another. We submitted to one another. We listened to the Lord and his word, and we did our best to listen to those who had training and expertise in medicine. And uh, even though we probably didn't 100% agree with one another on all things over the last two years, we came through one of the most challenging times in our lives. It seems just fine as the body of Christ here. I am thankful for that today. I thank the Lord for helping us through. I thank you for bearing with one another in love. I thank our doctors and nurses who helped us and guided us through something that none of us had ever experienced before. I, I, I couldn't be prouder in a godly way, I hope, uh, of this church right here and how we dealt with this, dealing with this together. Many churches, many churches throughout this land struggled mightily and fought and tore themselves up the last 24 months. Many of my preaching brethren are battered and bruised by their experience. And frankly, some of them deserved it and many did not. But that's the fact. But you wonderful brothers and sisters stood up in the Lord and you endured. I praise God for you. Back to our text. As we wrap this up, I want you to consider a question that I, I believe arises from this passage. Here it is. 
Is it possible to do what is right and still be wrong? Is it possible to do what is right and still be wrong? Here's what I mean. The nine Jewish men with leprosy, they did right, didn't they? I mean, Jesus told them to do something, and they did it. He told them, go to the priest, present yourselves to the priest, get checked out. Jesus told them to do the very thing the law said to do. If you felt you were over this illness. So Jesus told them, the law told them, and they went and did it. They went and performed the ritual that was required. They did the right thing. But still, they were wrong. Only one returned when he realized he had been cleansed and fell at the feet of Jesus and gave thanks. Only one, only the one Samaritan. The nine did right. The Samaritan did even better. You can be right and still get it wrong. That is, if you miss Jesus. It's a difference between ritual and relationship. We are not saved by a ritual. We are saved by a relationship, a relationship with the Savior. You can do a lot of right things and still miss Jesus. You see, there was something more wrong with all ten of these guys than this terrible physical disease that they suffered with. As important as their illness was and as devastating as it was, there was something Wrong that was even more important and even more deadly. It was a spiritual malady, sin. And the only way to deal with that is to actually get into relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and stay there and to live thankfully and worshipfully from then on. The nine, oh, they believed in miracles. They had reason to. And, and they praised God, I'm sure, in some way. And we praise God that they got a miracle to cleanse them of this, of this leprosy. But, but the one came back and got saved. He was made well after he was healed because of Jesus. I, I call on you this morning if you're here, if you're, if you're here but not in a relationship, a real relationship with Jesus the Christ, I call on you to turn to him and be saved. I remind you what the word says, Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, chapter 2, verse 26. For you are all sons of God through faith, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And as Paul was told uh, before he was saved, he was asked, Why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. And as the writer of the book of Hebrews said, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. It's great that you've been here today. It's great that you've participated in the worship of the church that you've perhaps sung praise to God, prayed to him, and just been a 
part of these important things on the Lord's day. That's wonderful. But ultimately, it is meaningless ritual without a true relationship with the Lord. Don't leave here today simply having completed a ritual. Make sure you leave here in relationship with your Creator and your Savior. And if we can help you, let us know how. Let us stand. Let us sing.